Welcome to another EduMed video. And in the next series of videos, we'll be going through the guidelines that have been produced by the Surviving Sepsis Council that were published on the 28th of March. I've divided the guidelines up into different parts because it's quite a large um, document and I've put a link to the document in the description below. In the first part, we'll be going through infection control. I mean, it's quite useful, there's a few things that are actually pertinent to us in intensive care, as well as people on the wards. <clears throat> there's a few things just to highlight here, and I think this is important with any video that we do about COVID. We don't know a lot about this disease, and we're constantly learning. So the things that are explained in this video and in these guidelines may well be updated and updated regularly. So I'd always check back to the link that I've put on the um, description to get the most recent documentation. And I'll put some more videos up if there are major changes to the guidelines. It's important also to um, note that they looked at um, 12 different countries and got 36 different experts together. So this is a consensus statement based on these experts who have varying degrees of experience both in the management of COVID patients and also in intensive care patients generally. <clears throat> what will strike you is that a lot of the um, guidelines are not really based on a lot of evidence. And so I would, as always with any guidelines, use it as a framework for your management, but treat the patient in front of you. They have made a really good effort to actually go through some of the data, look at all the systematic reviews, look at the randomized control trials that are available for other diseases and try to extrapolate it for COVID. And I think actually it's important to understand that critically unwell patients, whatever the underlying etiology are, getting the basics right is probably 90% of making sure that patients are treated well in intensive care. So whatever the nuances of the pathophysiology of COVID are, and we will find them out as time goes on, I think it's important that some of these guidelines are based on just getting the basics that we know work for patients and doing it correctly. So I, in general, I'm quite impressed with the guidelines that they've produced, and I think they're all relatively sensible suggestions. <clears throat> As with most consensus guidelines, they have different strengths of recommendation based on the amount of evidence that's um, present. They've divided things into either strong recommendation or best practice statements or weak recommendations. And like I say, the majority of the things that they suggest throughout the document are weak recommendations, purely based on the fact that we just do not have enough evidence to give us a good idea of what we can and can't do in this disease, or in fact what exactly this disease truly is at its underlying pathology. But suffice to say, the strong recommendations and best practice statements are probably applicable to the majority of patients, and everything else, the weak recommendations, are things that we should be taking and applying to the right patient at the right time, and that very much depends upon the clinician at the end of the bed making those decisions. There's been a lot of talk about giving adequate personal protective equipment for healthcare professionals. And I think it's really important to understand that actually as healthcare workers, we are at high risk. And especially with aerosol generating procedures, you're at significant risk. And so to protect yourself is important, not just for you as the clinician, as, as the person, but also for your family members and for your other uh, patients as well because we do know that a lot of people can be asymptomatic carriers. And so you could inadvertently infect a whole hospital just by not having the appropriate personal protective equipment that's fully fitted for you. <clears throat> the Chinese um, data is quite interesting, and they do quote this in the guidelines. And I think it's important because um, what it suggests is that almost 4% of healthcare workers developed um, coronaviral infections and of those 15 percent of the people who had severe and critical uh, illness were healthcare workers and of those five died so we really do have to 
keep in mind that as healthcare workers, we're at high risk. And so for any aerosol generating procedure, so that's intubating someone, doing a bronchoscopy, opening up the circuit. So instead of having a closed ventilatory circuit, we open it up to do things like suctioning the patient. We will expose both ourselves and others to risk. I think it's important that if you're going to manually ventilate someone or even just proning people, there is a risk of disconnecting the patient from the ventilator. Obviously, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation also has a high risk of aerosolizing into the atmosphere. So anyone or everyone who is exposed to this sort of um, potential aerosol generating procedure must be wearing N95 respirators or FFP2 or 3 masks. What this means is that you're preventing yourself from breathing in the small droplets that are just pushed out into the air so anyone can breathe them in and out. It's also important to note that the rest of personal protective equipment is just as important and some one thing that I really do see people not being so fastidious about is wearing face shields. Now the entry into the um, body of the COVID-19, of the coronavirus um, itself, is through mucous membranes. Now that can be inhalational and into the lungs, or it can be through the nose or through the eyes. And if you don't have a face shield, those two routes, especially the eyes, are not protected. So always be careful and always do wear the full personal protective equipment. We don't want to be part of this group who are ending up in intensive care. It's a really interesting um, point to this whole uh, guidelines is the where we should be doing aerosol generating procedures. Now best practice would be to do them in negative pressure rooms. What this means is that instead of the air flowing out of the room, the air, air gets sucked into the room and then sucked out through filters. And in doing so, by exposing a load of um, virus into the air, it doesn't then get pushed out into the rest of the hospital, but instead gets kept within the room and then sucked out. What is really interesting is that they mention a paper, it's a fairly old paper, it's a few years old, but they actually looked at using portable HEPA filters, and this is the particular HEPA filter that they used in the paper and set up a simulation whereby they had a look to see whether they could just put one of these portable HEPA filters in and see what happens to the amount of air that's um, filtered out and therefore neutralised from the virus. Now this is a really interesting study because they originally did this when the SARS-MERS outbreaks happened and people were worried about the fact that there may not be enough negative pressure rooms to be able to do aerosol generating procedures. So they got these portable um, HEPA filters, set up a room such as this, which is pretty much your standard ward where you've got six patients in a six by six um, room. And then they just measured what happened to the air. Now, without the HEPA filter, there was about 2.7 air exchanges per hour. This is air just passively diffusing out of windows, diffusing out of... Um, the air conditioning and out of the doors. That increased, almost doubled, with um, the just one HEPA filter being placed in one place. And what this HEPA filter does is it just drags air in, filters out all the viral particles and then pushes it out. Now, the true recommendations is that you should have 12 air changes per hour if you're going to have a aerosol generating procedure, but you can see automatically that it's quite useful. And there is a suggestion that if we can't have negative pressure rooms, maybe the next best thing is to have a whole bunch of these portable HEPA filters to try and purify the air and not to create as much of a viral burden in the local environment. Another thing that I found quite interesting in this um, paper was that they went through the evidence for why we have slightly lower levels of um, protection when doing non-aerosol generating uh, 
procedures and where this evidence comes from. And what they've suggested is that for non-ventilated patients and for those patients who are um, being managed, who are spontaneously breathing, they just suggest using surgical masks as opposed to the respirator masks. Masks. Now, note that this is a weak recommendation. There's a low quality of evidence. And similarly, and this is the thing that I found interesting, for non-aerosol generating procedures for mechanically ventilated patients, they still suggest a surgical or medical mask, not the respirator masks, i.e. the N95s or the FFP2 or 3 masks. I take issue with that. Personally, for my unit and for my uh, staff, what I suggest is that we wear the full respirator FFP3 masks. Now, my reasoning for this is that, yes, it may all be fine if they're on a closed circuit, but how often has one of those circuits accidentally disconnected because someone's uh, pulled on one of the tubings or when you're moving the patient over or if the patient coughs and they extubate themselves? Any of these things can happen. And then there we could expose our staff to high levels of virus very quickly. And so for those reasons, even though this recommendation says that for non-aerosol generating procedures on intensive care, just to wear a surgical mask, my personal preference would be that everyone on intensive care wears a um, full respirator mask to prevent that risk from accidental extubations or if people have um, accidental breakages of circuits or potentially if people are doing procedures and you're just not aware because it's on the other side of the um, unit. For all these reasons, I think when you're in a high dependency or critical care area, using a, a N95 or FFP3 mask, I think is reasonable. So I do take slight issue with this guideline here. The question comes is, are N95s as good as um, surgical masks for non-aerosol generating procedures? Now, we don't really know the answer to this question. And any of the data that we have is based on things from influenza mainly. And in influenza data, data it suggests that N surgical masks are actually just as good as N95s. Interestingly, however, if you look at measles, which has a much higher infectivity, then surgical masks are not as good as N95s, even for non-aerosol generating procedures. The best data that we have is based on four RCTs, which had about five and a half thousand patients. And what they suggested was that there was no increased infectivity when wearing a surgical mask versus an N95. You can see here that the odds ratio of uh, effectively one and the confidence interval, 95%, straddles one. So it doesn't really have a preponderance one way or the other. But what I want to highlight is the other part of this RCT, which even though didn't show significance, the confidence intervals all straddled one, there did seem to be a slight increase in the number of patients developing flu-like symptoms or getting respiratory symptoms when they wore a surgical mask compared to those who wore the N95. And intuitively, you know that that makes sense because the N95 or the FFP3 mask forms a better seal, prevents any of those viral particles that have been aerosolized in small droplet form from coming in. And whether someone coughs, sneezes, those things can all aerosolize and produce quite a wide spray of the virus. So the question of whether the N95 is better than the surgical mask, even though the data itself isn't conclusive, there is a signal there and just intuitively it does seem like the N95 or FFP3 masks seem to be better at preventing um, infections in healthcare workers. It's also worth just thinking about the studies that are there, because the studies are based mainly on influenza and SARS. If you look at SARS, it has an R0 of, um, of SARS-CoV-2, so this is coronavirus, 
It's got an R0 of 2.3. This is for every one person who is infected, they will infect two and a half other people effectively. This is based on early data. We're not actually quite sure whether that's correct or not. But you compare that to Spanish flu, which was only 1.8. So SARS-CoV-2 is far more infective than Spanish flu or influenza. And interestingly, the guidelines themselves actually say that if scarcity was not an issue, everyone should have fitted uh, respirators. And I think that's a really reasonable thing to say. And I think based on the fact that they're saying that, I would suggest even more of a reason why in intensive care, specifically, we should be wearing them just because of the risk of accidental extubations or mask disconnection, uh, ventilator disconnections and so on. This is more for the um, intensive care doctors and for the anaesthetists out there who are intubating. They do suggest using a video laryngoscope. Um, over direct laryngoscopy and part of the reason for that is you just have to get a little bit closer with direct um, laryngoscopy which we know is a potential aerosol generating procedure. There's a lot of studies out there suggesting that video laryng laryngoscopy is better than direct laryngoscopy, leads to less um, failed intubations, more first pass intubations and um, less hypoxia. Now all of those things are non-significant as you can see here aside from the failed intubations but if you're experienced in using video laryngoscopy I think it's a much safer thing and certainly what I advocate on our unit to do. Having said that if you're not experienced in using video laryngoscopy and it is a different technique and it depends upon the actual uh, video laryngoscope you're using you do have to be careful because you can cause errors, you can take longer to intubate and therefore cause more trouble. So be very mindful of exactly what is happening and what your specific skill set is. And I think that goes on to this next recommendation, which I think is key for any emergency intubation, but especially in the COVID cohort, which is that experienced people should be intubating these patients. These are not the intubations that we use to train juniors on. And the reason for this is that there's a higher risk of failed intubation or um, taking longer to intubate. And these patients do desaturate quickly and also there's a risk of increased aerosolization. Also, with poorer technique, you tend to go closer to the patient and that will increase the potential for increased viral load um, exposure to the intubator. So I wholeheartedly agree with this recommendation that only experienced people intubate these patients. Now, when thinking a little bit about the testing of these patients, it's interesting because I think all of the all of us who have been managing patients with COVID now for a while can speak of many, many patients who are swab negative for COVID, both nasopharyngeal and oral swabs. And then they behaved exactly like a COVID, got worse and worse, ended up intubated. And then when we do a tracheal aspiration or a bronchoscopy, we find that the patient actually has COVID. And we see that time and time again. And so what they suggest is that for mechanically ventilated patients with suspected COVID, and they say that every patient coming to critical care is suspected to have COVID unless proven otherwise. What they suggest is taking a lower respiratory tract sample and um, what they've suggested is actually doing endotracheal aspirations. And interestingly, over bronchial washings or BALs, these are directed BALs with a bronchoscope. And I would agree because these things are inherently aerosol generating. You can do endotracheal aspirates with closed suction systems and therefore dramatically reduce the risk of aerosolization into the atmosphere and also risk to both the patient and to the healthcare workers around. <clears throat> And just going on uh, with what I was saying before, all patients in critical care should be treated as COVID-19 until proven otherwise. And what's really difficult about SARS-CoV-2 is it's got a two-week incubation. 
And five days before the patient starts to present with any kind of symptoms, they're shedding virus. And for that reason, partly, we may not be able to know whether it's in the lower respiratory tract or the upper respiratory tract, depending upon where in that two-week period they are. And also, they may have um, got the virus, but they're in the, still in the first week, and therefore they're not shedding the virus, and therefore we can't detect it on the swabs. So even though they've got it, they're not showing symptoms, and their swabs may not be positive. So for all of these reasons, testing is difficult and why um, the antibody tests may be helpful. However, we are getting reports now of people not mounting any kind of antibody response to this and it purely being an innate immune response to it. So even the antibody tests may not be the greatest way to detect this virus. Now what um, the WHO and basically every country is um, advocating for is the real-time PCR tests with swabs. And that's what most people have available to them. It is important, however, to realise that the oral and pharyngeal swabs only have about a 50 to 60% positive predictive value. What this means is that if you've definitely got um, coronavirus, um, COVID-19 infection, if you swab yourself, only half of the time will you actually get a positive result. And there was an interesting study which looked at patients who had CT evidence of COVID and about half of those patients ended up with negative swabs even though CT looked like COVID and later on they d they deteriorated in a way similar to COVID and then the endotracheal um, aspirates proved that they did have COVID infections. So overall, I think for aerosol generating procedures, Having an FFP3 fitted mask is absolutely mandatory, but don't forget the rest of the personal protective equipment with that. For non aerosolizing um, procedures, so just general people on the ward, especially in the intensive care, there is no evidence that wearing a, a fitted mask actually adds any benefit. What I would say, however, is there is some suggestion that it might increase the risk of you getting an infection. So if you have the choice between a fitted mask and a um, surgical mask, I would say, especially in intensive care, where there's the risk of disconnections, there's a risk of people doing aerosolized generating procedures, I would wear a respiratory a fitted mask, an FFP3 mask. In terms of intubation, video laryngoscope should be first line. I know in places like America it already is. In places like the UK where we're still a little bit more old school, we use direct laryngoscopy. I would say if you're experienced in using a video laryngoscope, definitely use it. If you're not, then I'd probably get used to using one before you start intubating the um, sick COVID patients. And importantly, Tracheal aspirates seem to be just as good as bronchial lavages, so don't bronch these patients if what you're looking for is just a sample to prove COVID. Tracheal aspirates seem to be pretty good at doing so. In the next couple of videos, I'll be going through um, the hemodynamic uh, management of SARS-CoV patients, and um, I'll be going through the ventilator strategies, both invasive and non-invasive as well. And then finally, we'll go through some COVID specific treatments and the guidelines around those. Thank you very much.